Awesome. Um, well, I've got 1031, so we're late. Uh, but that's okay. We will make up for it with our praise and enthusiasm. Uh, but I'm going to open us up in prayer. Lord, uh, we just thank you for, uh, once again, another beautiful morning that we can come together and celebrate you and worship who you are. Uh, God, I just pray that you would be right in the middle of this, that you would... Um, you know, bless the bless Nick Scott as he's going to be uh, sharing the message with us. Bless this worship as we're going to be lifting it up to you. And just uh, thank you, Lord, that we get to meet together, uh, even though we are far apart, and get to have this time of fellowship and worship together. In your name, we pray. Amen. i 
Yes, Lord. Uh, you are all together uh, wonderful to us. I pray that you help Nick Scott communicate that message today uh, through his sermon about how everything you do uh, is in for our good, and for our development. And the, we pray that you just speak through him and help us uh, apply what we learn in our daily lives. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for that, Orkin. Am I coming through okay? Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, today we're going to be starting a new summer series, and we're going to be remembering and zooming in on the many promises of God throughout Scripture. And these are things that we can count on as we go through highs and lows of life and uh, try to do God's will. And we kind of had a little brainstorming session, the teachers team coming up with which ones we're going to be covering over the next couple of weeks. And I, I kind of got some sort of vibes that reminded me a little bit of some like fundamental equations from my engineering classes. I know there's a few engineers hiding out in the Ablaze crew. So for some of you guys, this, this uh, analogy will work better than others, but like, you know, it just reminds me of things like you know, the ideal gas law, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, Bernoulli's equation, Kirchhoff's law, Ohm's law, Galpalot's third law. Actually, the last one was from a potions class in Harry Potter, but you guys get the point. We have to, when you have these kinds of equations and fundamental things, they can be really helpful for understanding what's going on around us and finding unknowns from, you know, a problem in front of you. And I think... God's promises can do something similar for our own lives. When we have these and we remember them and we have them in front of us, that can help us find like those unknowns and get to the heart of you know what's going on. And today's promise, as Orkin said, is uh, how God works all things for the good of those who love him. So, um, excuse me, I have a sinus infection and I'm trying to keep up my breathing with my talking and it is unusually hard today. Uh, so, What's really cool when you look at the promises of God is that they're usually so fundamental that they appear in different places throughout scripture. It's like the same idea repeating again and again. So we're going to read a couple of those um, that just kind of hit on this point of God working out things for good for the people that love him. Uh, so starting first in uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through, for, through 28, 24 through 28, he says, for in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself will intercede for us through wordless groans. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And then our memory verse, verse 28 of Romans 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And then our sort of other place in scripture where this kind of comes up again, it's Paul writing to Corinth, but he's recalling the words of Isaiah. So it's kind of like a double whammy, like it's, it's two remembering of the same promise. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 9 through 10. It says, however it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, these are the things that God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. And that's a life verse that I've held on to through several difficult classes in engineering and trying to be like, you know, he's got plans, he's got plans, even if I fail statics, he's got plans. Um, the last one we'll look at is in uh, Jeremiah when he's writing to the exiles of Israel. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So God works all things out for our good. But why is this promise important to remember? Well, I don't know if you guys have looked around lately or at any time in your life, but bad stuff happens all the time to us and everybody around us 
all the time. So this is a promise that no matter what's going on, we can be assured that God is on our side and he's at work. And this is a good thing to remind ourselves of because I think our instinct, at least mine, a lot of times is whenever something bad happens to me, uh, my first thought is, why? Why me? Why do I have to always get caught at the red light? Why does this guy drive so slow? Why does work so hard? You know, all these things. So these questions are natural, and but they're not always productive questions to ask, right? Um, there's some reasons why that we can answer. It's just, a, do we need to ask this question every single time something bad happens? Or can we go, okay, here's why. And now when this stuff happens, we can ask ourselves a more productive question to um, process through difficult times. So uh, why do bad things happen? The first thought that we might have is like punishment. Like in the, the Old Testament, there's a lot of cases where God would intervene and directly negatively affect the lives of his people or the people around him as a consequence for sin and disobedience. And it can be really easy to attribute negative things that happen in our lives to some sort of perceived sin or uh, negative aspect in our lives or somebody around us. Like it can be easy to make those same parallels. Like I did something bad, therefore this happened to me. <clears throat> Examples throughout scripture that might lead you to believe that is like, you know, uh, God sending the flood because the people on earth were full of sin and bad. Um, God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah because it was full of sin and bad threatening to destroy it because it was full of sin and bad, but that one they turned around, that was good, but he was gonna. And then uh, Israel being conquered several times and enslaved and things because they were full of sin and bad. Like, you know, it's like, okay, there's, we're seeing a pattern there, but where it can be unproductive or dangerous to have that same this than that view as Christians now is, uh, well, so, it's, we're in a different situation. We'll talk about that here in a, in, a, in a second, but now it could be easy to like say, okay, you know, because, you know, I'm struggling with, you know, pornography or something. That's why that tornado hit my house. It's like, mm, I don't really think that's, that's not really the way that God's operating um, right now because we're Christians. We're different. We'll talk about that. But if like, sometimes it is a clear cut, like this happened, you did this and then this happened. Like, if you're at school and you cheat on like a bunch of tests and then you get caught and then the honor court suspends you and throws you out of school, yeah, that's a consequence of sin, but that didn't require divine intervention. You cheated and you got thrown out of school. Um, but we need to remember as Christians that we are now righteous in God's eyes, right? Like we're not in the, there's a reason in the Old Testament, there was all this stuff, this, this conflict that existed between God and people and even his own people even though he was much more merciful to his own people, there's just this always this sin that was building up that needed to be like accounted for. Um, but that's what Jesus was for, for us. So if we read second Corinthians uh, chapter five, 17 through 21, uh, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Then skipping a couple of verses to get to 21, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him, we might become righteous, the righteousness of God. So we are no longer this like open wound of sin in the world that needs to be disciplined or like a cancer that has to be cut out and removed through acts of God. You know, we, we're his children now and we are paid and bought in full. He doesn't see this sin anymore it's not a barrier between us and him all the time that has to be you know dealt with or punished it was deleted on the cross when we accepted you know jesus christ that is that's what our situation is now our names are in the book of life so punishment and punishment is a sort of a if we have that sort of process that that sort of thought like i did bad stuff so bad stuff happened to me you can also easily go i did good stuff so good stuff should happen to me and that starts to get into like prosperity gospel. And it's not, I don't believe, we don't believe that that's what scripture is usually saying. If you read the New Testament and you think, 
all these guys that were super on fire for Jesus had really amazing world outcomes and great like stock returns and everything and didn't have horrible agonizing deaths. Like, I don't know what New Testament you're reading. Like in some sense, the more on fire you are, the, the harder things get. So, you know, the, the punishment side, were, that's, that's not really a good interpretation. Sometimes there are clear cut things like, yeah, I cheated on a test and I paid the consequences for it, but it's not God running around with a hammer now knocking people down. Everything was paid for on the cross. Praise God. So if not punishment, what's another why bad things happen? Well, I think the more um, applicable one is just that we need to re realize that we live in a broken world, right? Um, in that first in Corinthians, we read said that we are a new creation, right? Our spirit is now a new creation. We're alive through Jesus. The rest of the world and our bodies are still part of the old creation that is under the curse of sin. That's why ever since that fruit was eaten, it's really hard to grow crops. You have to work really hard. Animals eat each other. There's disease and death and people don't live very long. And at the end of the day, um, earth is kind of the devil's kingdom right now. Like it's the cursed fallen world and he can do whatever he wants um, to some limits. He can do whatever he wants as long as he's allowed to essentially. But all sorts of bad stuff just happens because, you know, we're, it's full of people that are, you know, still in flawed bodies and broken and there's flawed just systems around, right? Like I don't believe something like a miscarriage or a hurricane or a school shooting or something is like an act of God. There's just broken people and broken things happening and it's, it kind of sucks sometimes, but the thing to really process when we just accept that right now we're still in the, the fallen creation. New creation is all revelation stuff that we can look forward to when Jesus comes back. But right now things aren't in that perfect state. The hard thing to think about is God doesn't send bad things like these, these horrible disasters and stuff, but he doesn't always stop them from happening, right? And so that's that's the tough cookie to digest. And that's when you get like those cool stories like Daniel and um, uh, why am I blanking on their names? I'm just thinking about Veggie Tales, but Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. There we go. I should never be able to forget those. But, you know, being faced with death, like thrown into an inferno or into the lion's den, you know, they had an attitude of God can save me and I won't you know, fall down and kneel to you. But if he doesn't save me, I'm still not going to do it. Like they were okay with the alternative of he, he might not save me. And I think that's where we get that sort of attitude is where we start getting to the, situ the, the question that we can ask ourselves that's more productive than why, why me? It's more of, okay, this thing has happened primarily because we're living in a broken world and bad stuff happens sometimes, but this is the situation I'm in. How should I respond? And what can God teach me from this? Those are productive questions to ask ourselves when bad stuff happens. And this gets us to that sort of mindset of viewing stuff as trials and training when things get hard and when things are, when bad stuff happens. Um, and that begins to shift our perspective and it creates a lot of opportunity for one of the ways God can bring good out of difficult situations and bad stuff happening is through growth. He can work on us. Um, some of that good that comes out is our own growing closer to him, um, being better at relationships and um, just growing into maturity. I got a couple verses um, in Romans chapter five, one through five. Uh, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And then looking again, continuing with our theme of really important stuff in the Bible rhymes and it shows up multiple times. 
uh, James chapter one, two through four says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be made mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So God can work good through all things. And many times that can show up in growth in our own lives, growing closer to him, perfecting our faith and our relationship with him through those hard times, through those trials and that training. Um, but sort of talking about these points, it leads me to sort of what's been going on in my own life, um, where God's been working on me. Uh, one thing I wanted to share was how, um, even though you know what God's will is and what you should be doing, um, you're like trying to build the kingdom just because you're, that's what you're working on doesn't mean that you're going to not have um, trials and struggles or that uh, there's going to be like, it doesn't mean just because you know God's will doesn't mean it's going to be like easy, right? His plan isn't necessarily the path of least resistance. <clears throat> and over the past uh, couple of years, it's kind of been the reality for the, the church plant group in Richmond. And we've been committed to this purpose. We heard the call and we believe that this is where God wants us to be and what, we want, what he wants us to do. And we've been consistently trying to take steps that pursue this goal and get us into the right position and um, move us geographically closer, all these things. But several times we've met roadblocks or speed bumps or even just big clouds of uncertainty on things because there's a lot about this process we can't really control. Um, and I, this is a small aside, but um, Nick Pearson had a sermon a couple weeks ago, like two or three weeks ago, um, just the whole thought of the ask, seek, knock. And there's a lot of stuff in that that really applied to the church plant situation that, you know, there's, you, you pray about it, you ask God, but you still, there's still the steps of seeking and knocking afterwards where you got to still actively be participating and God makes up the difference and does a lot of really cool things, but you still have to be an active participant and not just sit around and wait for it all to happen on its own in a sense. So there's a lot of that in here. So it was really cool seeing how that, some of the stuff that Nick talked about uh, was what I was actively seeing going on. Um, the church plant, it's been kind of a part of our lives, a dream of ours for like four or five years now. And um, there's some steps, like some checkpoints we've been trying to knock off. We first were in school, we needed to graduate so that we could actually do this thing. So that was like our first thing. I ever to graduate. Um, we did, but not all at the same time. And so there was a little bit of in between where I started working in Blacksburg and Jimmy and Yama were finishing up um, school and uh, just waiting for people's schedules to align. Um, after Brian and Yana got married, there was a, they were going to find a spot in Richmond. And so it was like a good time for, okay, we can go down there. Jimmy's still looking for work. Um, it's a little harder for him to find a spot because he's wicked smart and has a PhD in chemical engineering, which there's not, not, not every place hires chemical engineers. So it's a little harder to find a good spot. Um, but uh, we took the leap of faith about a year and a half ago now. And because of like apartment life, you kind of have to commit uh, in advance, right? Like you don't necessarily know you have to, I mean, they make you renew your lease like four or five months in advance. So we were like, all right, well, we're going to shoot for Richmond. And so we didn't renew and we went to Richmond to look for apartments and stuff. And the plan was, all right, we're going to go down and I'll try to find a job and started looking in like March. Um, but we signed the lease and we're heading down here and then um, COVID hit. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try to find a job in the middle of a pandemic economy where the stock market's at 16,000. All right. It's going to be fun. And um not a whole lot happened for seven months. Um, and unfortunately, we couldn't even do a whole lot of like church plant stuff because there's a pandemic <laughs> going on. So it's like, okay, it feels like this feels like a big road bump in the way. And you know, we're trying to do God's will. And there was just the whole world is dying. <laughs> you know? So uh, it was tough. And, you know, there during the unemployment like window, there was like other trials and stuff that kind of came in the form of like, I had friends from work from the, pre the place I'd left and, um, you know, certain uh, conversations with like family members where there was like, 
some advice to, you know, after X amount of time, you know, just expand your search job wise and leave Richmond if you have to sort of thing, because you need a job, you know, there's going to be a big open window where, you know, how are you going to explain that on your resume that you weren't working for seven months or, you know, whatever. And so it, it felt like I was running out of time. And um, I finally got a job, finally got an offer, one offer. And, uh, uh, it, you know, cool, cool work, but it's in Fredericksburg, which is, it's a three hour commute all the way back and forth. So even though it was like another sort of step, it still felt like the check, the box hadn't been fully checked. Like that just didn't feel like, it doesn't feel like, church planting material in a sense. Like, you know, I, I feel like I don't have enough time to do all this kind of stuff. And, you know, just all these things, it just has always felt over the past four or five years, like there was always a year or two left to go until we'd be able to start something. It just, and then the, the goalposts just felt like they kept being moved. And so it just felt hard to get any progress. And I didn't want to like quit. Like this is, this is God's will for my life, right? That's what I need to do. But these roadblocks keep coming up and I just didn't, I wanted to at least be, I wanted to strike out at least, you know, I didn't want to like lose the game and be on the bleachers the whole time, you know, like sitting in the dugout. Like I wanted to just let me go out there and fail. And then I'll be like, all right, we failed. We'll go back, but just let me try first, you know? And um, I just say this because it can really feel sometimes it can be easy to feel like uh, maybe you made a mistake or maybe you misheard or you're on the wrong track, you know, you're kind of, it's going to be easy to expect, like, you know, God's just going to blow doors open, just right off the hinges, like, oh, yeah, that's the way I'm supposed to go, easy, but sometimes um, the doors are just, like, slightly open or don't open at all, and you're just left waiting in the hall, waiting for which door is going to open, and for me, one of the things that it took a while to fully comprehend, but just that idea to remember that just because you're on, you're, you're pursuing God's plan, uh, following his will does not mean that what you're doing is going to be easy or that it's going to be instantaneous. Okay. And this reminds me of, um, like David. Okay. Like these are some examples of people where bad situations become good throughout, um, the, the old Testament is what we're looking at right now. But, um, David, he was anointed to become King when he was a teenager. Samuel came, poured the oil on his head and everything. And then he slew Goliath and he started working for Saul. Things were looking like he was on the right career path to become the king. And then Saul went crazy and tried to have him killed for 20 years and chased him around the countryside. And the people he was supposed to be ruling were the ones that were trying to murder him in his sleep. And it's like, how do I become king after this? But he became king. Like that was still God's will and plan. And it came, came to fruition. Joseph, he had dreams from God that he was going to save slash have his... Um, brothers and like the whole world bow down to him at some point and it's like okay that's cool but then he was sold into slavery and thrown in prison for like 20 years and it'd be really hard to be like well this doesn't feel like the next step towards that thing you said that i was going to be doing and even during that time he was still having dreams and had faith that the dreams that he was getting were true from god and he was interpreting them and that led to him becoming second in charge of all of Egypt and being able to save his family from famine and have everybody bow down to him, like God said. So just because it's God will doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight or that it's going to be easy. Being a slave for 20 years isn't fun. Neither is being on the run from your brothers and sisters that want to murder you, even though you're going to be their king one day. Like, that's not fun. Um, so it doesn't happen overnight. And these examples are encouraging and really cool. But if we know what God's will is, how do we practically what are some stuff that just helps us keep going you know like okay they did it yeah but how how on like you know day you know 10,004 of being a slave do you go well waiting for God's dream to come true how do you keep that positivity up right and you know and just as an aside when we're talking about God's will uh, we've talked about this in the past I just wanted to throw something in here but um you know if this is something that you are trying to figure out in your life there's a lot of really cool steps you can take um to figure out God's will are like a blaze plug-in for this is a thing called the three-legged stool of, you know, prayer, uh, scripture, and godly counsel to help figure out, you know, what is your path going forward if this decision you're making is um, a good one to make on that sort of a path. But assuming you get there, and that's, we've got sermons in the past to check on those, or you can talk to, you know, Bible study leaders or, you know, any of the pastors around and would love to talk about it. Um, Assuming you get there and you're like, all right, this is the thing I need to do. 
how do you keep going? And for me, uh, over the last eight months at the Fredericksburg job that I've been going to, one with a really long commute, I have really struggled with discontent, feeling exhausted and unfulfilled at work. Like, I just felt like my life was just draining away. Like, I'm just on this insane drive. And every day, it, they're like 14 hour days that I'm, I'm working, um, or 13. And uh, it just, you get back and then I'm supposed to open the computer up and look for more jobs. And it just, it's, it's, it's demoralizing. And a message from God like kept surfacing during these long drives, especially if I just, there was nothing on the radio, I just turn it off. And there's this idea of where he was asking me, are you willing to suffer for this? Like, would you stay in Richmond and keep doing this church plant if the job isn't good? And that was a tough question to think about because it was not fun. Um, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a long drive. And for Megan, a lot of this has been like, especially with the pandemic, just like being alone because you know, we, we left a lot of our friends and we don't have the same um, social support and being able to interact with everybody is normal. Um, and everybody's feeling that, but she works remote and then I'm gone 54 hours of the week. And then when I do get home, I'm tired and usually go to bed around like eight, sometimes seven. And so she only gets two hours with me before I'm tapped out. Um, and it's just tough. Like this has been a trial of picking ourselves back up again, over and over, applying the jobs. Even if the week before I got rejected after two interviews and getting our hopes up. So it's been, it's been hard. And there's a few things I've found that have helped. And one thing I, I found most wholesome that I enjoyed doing, it's not easy to do, but once you've kind of built up the habit of it, it, it takes the edge off a lot is like exercising your faith to like imagine the cool things that God could do. Like, you know, looking around and thinking, man, eventually this is gonna be awesome. Like, you know, I feel like, you know, especially if, if you look back at the, the things that, you know, God's done in your life or other people's lives, you can start to see the same kind of signs, you know, you're like, man, I feel like I'm in the middle of a testimony right now. I just not to the good part yet. I'm in the hard part, you know? So I'd love to see what this is going to get turned out to be, you know? And if we can step back and look at our circumstances, remember, you know, what's God's done, it can really, um, it can really make a situation a lot less like hopeless or even for me, there were times when I would be like unnaturally hopeful. And I guess that's kind of the piece that transcends all things. Um, it's hard to make it sustain forever because there's like a little bit of up and downs, you know, but when you get those highs where you, somehow you're hopeful about the situation, even though you just got rejected from a job after, you know, looking for months, um, I, I feel like I'd be looking around at like how dire the situation is or how like drained I was. And I'm like that, you know, a little meme with the dog in the comic where he like has the little coffee cup and uh, is just sitting in a coffee shop that's a raging inferno of fire. And I felt like me, I'm just sitting around, I'm like, yeah, this is fine. Okay, well, I wonder what God's gonna do with this mess. Okay, this is gonna be cool. And uh, that really helped change my perspective a little bit, just trying to practice that and going, man, wouldn't it be crazy if after all this, God just does like this one thing? Or what if all this is just to make us get this one point and then it just happens? Like just thinking about goofy stuff like that has helped kind of like raise my excitement almost. It's like theory crafting your own life a little bit of cool things God could do, not to put them in a box, but just to be open to the possibilities and recognizing that even if, you know, whatever it is, it, it, it will be better than what I can imagine because that's what God does. So that helped change my perspective a lot um, when dealing with like long stretches where no jobs were even available for me to apply to or when I did find one just getting rejected or not hearing back at all. And I, I wanted to kind of tell you this testimony because um, I believe, and I think Paul believes too, um, faith and hope in God is very infectious. Paul talks in Romans, Romans chapter one, uh, this is verses eight through 12. He says, gosh, I'm running out of breath. <laughs> he says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. 
because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Paul was no stranger to hardship. I think one of his biggest coping mechanisms that he relied on was hearing about faith of others, seeing it, seeing the growth in their lives, and it kind of just made it all worth it, right? Like he had his relationship to God, but there was just something fundamental about being able to hear, see, and feel it that it just made the faith kind of like just, it's like, you know, one of those like funhouse mirrors where all the mirrors point at each other. You can just see like forever. It's like that where the faith just bounces off each other and just gets stronger and stronger. And you know, that's one of the reasons why I like being part of the Ablaze family and being in Bible studies is so you can hear all the ways that God's active. We try to make a point of showing when prayer gets answered, you know, when possible, like something that we heard coming up and then you know, we, we pray about it. And then months later, it could be like God did something and we want to make sure everybody hears it because it's like, if you don't, it's just kind of like a wasted, wasted faith boost that we don't know about if it just kind of goes off and is forgotten because God is always at work. Um, you know, somebody might have passed a, you know, a test they were really stressed out about, or a loved one recovering from uh, a medical issue or something, or somebody finding a job. And um, this is one of the reasons why I was excited to talk about this topic today and share the testimony about this whole Richmond uh, job situation. Um, after it's been 15 months of on and off, never really stopping job searching and just scrolling down the Indeed and Glassdoor pages. Um, and I've gotten one offer in all that time and a lot of nothing. Um, in the last week or two, two jobs, two companies contacted me with about positions uh, at the same time. And both made me offers. And both of them told me I was their number one candidate. And the coolest thing is, is one of the biggest reasons for both companies, the reason my resume was so appealing was because I listed my activities at a blaze um, down in like my skills communication section. I talked about how I had learned a lot by, um, you know, like presentation skills and being able to be in front of a crowd and everything because, you know, being part of the teaching team gave me a lot of practice. I was able to learn to speak and be confident and be okay in front of people and how um, taking me uh, to be, uh, listening class and how that, that Tony had run learning about empathetic listening and conflict resolution. That's something that's very useful in a big company and making sure that you're going to be part of the team. And I was sure to plug those in my, um, the interviews that I had and uh, apparently it clicked and God gave me two jobs and both of these jobs are 20 miles away within that range, which is like, 15 or 18 minute drive compared to the hour and a half it takes me to get to where I'm going right now. So it's, it's crazy. And it was because of the God stuff on my resume that I popped up to the top of these jobs. So for me, it's like, okay, cool. We're finally at the part where the testimony starts to, starts to go up. This is amazing. This is better than what I imagined. This is really cool. And I just hope that, you know, if you're in a trial right now, if you're unsure or doubting yourself or God, um, that you would just be encouraged to keep going and pers persevere. You know, once you find out what God's will is in your life, it's still going to be hard sometimes. Um, but God's always going to be working. He's always going to be on your team and working for stuff, even if you can't see it. He writes amazing testimonies. And I can't wait to hear about the cool things that are going to be happening um, in your guys' lives. So, We've covered a lot of ground today. I've got a little summary page. We're gonna go through some of these. I think it's like five or six points. So uh, to start off, we started off introducing God's promises. Our, these are gonna be things that we can hold on to that'll help us better understand and respond to the world around us. we we'll me be doing that over the summer. Uh, God's promise of working all things for the good of those who love him is something that we can count on because bad things happen, right? The world is full of all sorts of bad things. It's a broken world. 
um, not really as a result of punishment for everything we're doing, but just you know, a fact of like it's it has not been made a new creation yet. And a good good question to ask ourselves when bad things happen is how can we respond to this? How what can we learn? Like what can God teach us through this moment? And in many ways, the good that God does is the development that He's able to work on us as we respond to these situations we're in. Um, to strengthen our relationship with him and those around us and make us more like him and be made more perfect, lacking in nothing, right? And then understanding that even when, you know, we're, we're, we're following after God's will, sometimes bad things will still happen and will get in the way. And just because it's God will, God's will does not mean it's going to be easy or that it's going to be instantaneous. And I think it's just really cool you know, when you think about it, just remember that God has already redeemed the worst situation in history and worked it out for our greatest good, right? The world was doomed to sin and rejected its savior, then killed him. But now today, each of us are saved by faith because God brought good out of that, resurrected Jesus, and he is cleansed us. We no longer have that held against us anymore. We are a new creation, the spirit in us. So compared to such good coming from so much bad, I think we can have faith that no matter what sort of situation we find ourselves in now, no matter how hard it is or unsure we are, that God has done more and he is active and working in our lives for our good, even if we can't see it yet. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just... Thank you for so much for being a God that just keeps his promises, that makes these wonderful things that we can hold on to to better comprehend the world we're in and, um, you know, just be able to process and work through the bad stuff that happens. Um, we live in a broken world and you've saved us from this, but we're still here. We still have work to do and people to reach and trying to do your will. Just pray that you would just give us perseverance to, you know, continue on <clears throat> so that we can be made perfect and be um, just even stronger, um, better at what you've got in store for us, Lord. These trials will teach us things that'll help us to be better to do your will in the future. I just pray that um, we would just continue the good fight, um, run the race, and uh, not be discouraged. And that um, when you do come through, God, and that when you do great things and bring good out of the bad, that we would just be overflowing with excitement, um, be humble, recognizing that it was you at work that we would just share our stories with each other just to um, flow that, in, that, that infectious faith, Lord, that comes from hearing about you at work because we serve an amazing God that does amazing things and is at work in our lives. You are alive. You are not a dead God or a God of, you know, just pages in a book, Lord. You're alive and working now. And we just thank you for that and just um, uh, look forward to seeing all the ways you're going to be working in your your. Uh, people's lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that, that reminder that God works all things for the good of those who love him, but not always in our timing or our definition of good. It's all about his timing, his definition of good. I, I especially really like the part, Nick, where you said, um, you know, recognizing that you might be in the middle of a testimony right now. And just the mind shift, the mind shift that can happen with, um, you know, how do I want to this testimony to go? How do I want to be able to share my side from this testimony, the things that I was doing, the faith that I was exhibiting in the middle of this testimony, recognizing and being aware that right now, okay, I'm in the middle of this situation. How am I going to do my side of it? Obviously, God can do whatever he's going to do. But what are what are my actions going to be in the middle of that uh, testimony, I thought was, um, was very cool. Um, so I think we're gonna we're gonna transition a little bit here. Uh, we don't really have that many many announcements, so I'm gonna go ahead and do them. Hey, what up? It's your boy Nick back at it again with some more announcements. Um, I, the only things we've got are uh, just letting people know to to keep connected to your life groups. Uh, make sure that as we're sort of distanced here over uh, the summer, that we stay connected spiritually. Uh, through our life groups. Uh, there's all kinds of ways we can do that virtually. Um, also, memory verse from last week. 
uh, Matthew 724 from Tony's sermon on building and on sand and on rock. Does anyone have either here or uh, on Zoom? Does anyone have Matthew 724? Somebody. Tony has it, but that's not fair. Uh, cool. I'll go ahead and read it just so that we've got it. Uh, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Uh, and the memory verse for this coming week for us to remember is Romans uh, 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Uh, so we'll have that one for next week. A really powerful verse for us to just uh, internalize. Last, um, last little announcement before I hand it off to Tony here. Next week, we're going to hear from Nick, the pasta loving Pearson. Um, this is hard, Virgil. Um, <laughs> about uh, asking for wisdom, which is actually in two different ways is going to be a sequel sermon. Uh, so find out more about uh, how I'm building on two previous sermons uh, in this one. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it over to Tony now. I had one ready too. I was, I had a, I had a, I was going to call you Pat, Nick the Pastor Pearson. So it never been used, but anyway. Um, yeah, what a, what a great sermon and what a, what a tough topic in a sense, because you know, there is suffering in the world and all those things, all those things to try to cover. One of the things that I want to just like give a like our theological position about one thing, and I think Nick hit on it, but I want to make it really clear. We don't come from the, the school of thought that God is making all of these bad things happen so that then he'll um, use them. I think there are there are places in the world, there's theologies that, you know, God is controlling all that and but in James 1, 13 through 17 says, don't say that God is tempting you when you're tempted and you drug away and you, and you sin. People have, do that. They sin, they, they um, sin against God, they sin against you. And again, that's something that's part of the love relationship that God has allowed. Is that he allows us to reject him. He allows us to reject each other. He allows us to sin against one another. But that's all part of the, he also allows us to love him and to love others. And, we want to just live in that relational nature of, of God. And um, again, that's just a, a tension thing to balance and try to understand. But really appreciate the sermon. That was really powerful, Nick. Thanks so much. All right. Well, um, we will. Are there any questions about that? Because again, this that's a really big topic. And I know it's probably could have been a whole series by itself because it's so much to it. But um, anyway. Oh, I, I do want to share one of the things I, you know, I come from a broken home. I know some of you guys do, and you start to think, well, was it God's will for my, you know, for my mom or my dad to leave? And I, I would, I would just say, just be careful with that. You know, God's will sometimes can be thwarted again by will thwarted. That's kind of a tough one, but by his, his design, his plan is to let us choose this love relationship in a sense, in a way. And so when other people make terrible decisions and they sin against us, um, God's going to, the, the, the message of this message of the promise is he'll use that for our good. And I think Nick was right on that. A lot of times it's just for our growth and that's, you know, the humility and all those things that come from those trials. So anyway. Right. So Nick was just saying his, his plan is that those things would work out, but that he uses them uh, if we do make bad choices. So yeah. anyway, just wanted to just, get, just add those little nuances to this. And again, this is a massive topic and really appreciate the, the way Nick shared it today. All right, well, have a great week and um, connect with your life groups and connect with one another. And if you don't see somebody on here, it might be because they're going to church with their family, which is spectacular, but it also might mean that they're struggling. So reach out to your friends and make sure that this transition back home is going well for them and um, just stay connected this year, this summer. See y'all.